All right, so the recording is now started. Again, you can turn off your audio and your video if you don't want to be recorded, but your presence will still be recorded. Um, I don't know if they're still doing a little weird voice saying we're recording this meeting now. I don't get it. I, yeah, okay, all right. It doesn't come over on my side, so glad that still comes up. Well, I hope everyone got their clocks turned back, or at least some of their clocks turned back. I know some of you didn't, but that's okay. That happens about twice a year. Um, welcome to Lion's Roar. We'll give it a few minutes before we get started with prayers. Um, Doug, do you want to do the prayers today? I, I'll present them, but if you just want to say them, okay. When we're ready, I'll let you know. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and present the prayers, and uh, we'll take it from there afterwards, okay? Give me one moment, Doug. Okay. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of God, all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, Gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. 
When you, Chief of Humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supreme fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms. Unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage. To all, worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects. With supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yudams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratna manalakam nirateyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on Massa Vultures Mountain, on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. 
At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharivataputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unpro unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, complete, unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate Gate, Pada Gate, Pada Samgate, Bodhi Soha. We'll repeat this 21 times silently. Teata gate gate para gate para sam gati bodhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the prof profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, 
saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. You should, one should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryavalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Um, my name is Susan Farrar, and um, I'm one of Lama Jimpa's students, for those of you who don't know me. And I just realized I took refuge 13 years ago, not to the day, but pretty close. It was 13 years ago, I think in November, or this month, like it's already November. Um, so before I get started on this, and um, I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on a couple of um, terms because I don't know quite everybody who's here today. So I'm just going to read the definitions of two terms that I'm going to use a lot, which is bodhicitta and bodhisattva. So bodhicitta is the mind that aspires to attain the state of complete enlightenment of a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And a bodhisattva is a being who has developed that mind of enlightenment in order, and the mind that wants to become enlightened or is enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So I'm gonna use those terms a fair amount. Um, this is not so much a, this is kind of amusing. This is kind of a, an exploration. So I'm gonna invite comments and hopefully you'll have some. So um, I've been studying as part of this, um, you know, having a lot of time on my hands. Um, I've been studying something called the Bodhicharya Vitara, which is um, also called the Bodhisattva way of life or the way of the Bodhisattva, um, along with a number of other people in a study group that we meet on every other Saturday morning. And in a, um, the first chapter of this text, Shantideva, the author of the text, introduces two different kinds of bodhicitta. So I'm going to read just a couple of stanzas from chapter one. Um, chapter one is usually called something like the excellence of bodhicitta or the benefits of the awakening mind. So these are, this is stanzas 15 and 16 from the first chapter. And he writes, Bodhicitta, the awakened mind, is known in brief to have two aspects. First, aspiring, bodhicitta in intention. Then active bodhicitta, practical engagement, as corresponding to the wish to go, and then to setting out. The why should understand respectively the difference that divides these two. So the analogy between these two different kinds of bodhicitta, the aspiring and the active or the engaged bodhicitta is usually given um, something like, you know, the aspiration, the desiring to go on a trip and then actually embarking on the trip. And you know, that analogy has never really been quite satisfactory for me. For some reason, it's just, it doesn't feel, it feels kind of flat. It doesn't feel dynamic enough. So um, my question really that I want to explore is what is the distinction between aspirational and engaged bodhicitta? And, you know, it seems like, well, duh, right? One's wishing and the other is doing. But I really don't think it's that simple. I am actually not convinced that there's actually separation between the two. 
um, because they're also known as relative and ultimate bodhicitta, you know, conventional and, and ultimate bodhicitta. And if there's anything that we have heard from Lama La over and over again, is that we have to hold relative and ultimate together. They aren't separate. They are together. We practice them both together. They're both part of our lives. So what follows really is just an investigation into what is bodhicitta and how do I, how can we express this aspiration and actively engage in this activity? And actually the inspiration for this was um, a number of talks that I've been hearing recently, not only from Lama Jimpa, but also um, from Sangha members. So, um, and so there's been a lot of comments and stories that have been given by, by Sangha members that have really been quite inspiring. So I'm hoping that other people will have more stories today. So one line of thinking follows something that Lama frequently talks about, and that's the equal importance of training and practice. Um, training is a structured, predictable, supportive, controlled activity. It includes, you know, the three-prong approach of study, contemplation, and meditation, and discussion among ourselves with like-minded people. And then there's the rest of our life, which is spontaneous, unpredictable, frequently a little scary, always quite challenging. So we have these two pieces all the time. And Lama, in a talk, characterized these two pieces as a funnel that drives us, encourages us, gives us the confidence to engage in the bodhisattva way of life. So there's the training, and then there is our unpredictable life, but it's a funnel. There's other components, uh, the other components being a teacher, um, Sangha members, you know, people that we can talk to and relate with. But basically, it's the formal training that we put together, that we practice every day, and couple that with this complicated, unrehearsed life that results, I think, in bodhisattva activity. Um, I'm thinking, you know, and this is maybe a stretch, but maybe the training, the supportive, the um, predictable part of our lives might be um, analogous to aspirational bodhicitta. And maybe this unpredictable, spontaneous part of our lives might be analogous to engage bodhicitta. I don't know. That was just one way of thinking about it that, that I was playing with. So um, if there's any comments on that, you know, unmute yourself. Or not. Okay. <laughs> um, another approach to opening up this aspiration and moving into action is a technique that Lama has used on us, all of us, probably multiple times. And that's being put on the spot. Being asked to do something that we're maybe unfamiliar with, not comfortable doing, being asked to work with somebody that we're maybe having some difficulties with and it's gonna be a challenge but being put on the spot. And that experience, even though it's uncomfortable, if we can, if I can, get past the resistance, it's a really incredible growth opportunity. Um, I think that it's one of the ways that leads from aspirational to engage bodhicitta is being put in this uncomfortable situation where you have to be spontaneous, where you have to be really open. It's direct, right? It's person to person, hand to hand. It's very direct. It's very on the spot. 
So this training that hopefully we have all been engaged in and have built up gradually, like aspiration, aspiration is a gradual buildup and training is a gradual buildup. And hopefully we've gotten enough support to be able to engage in a spontaneous way in our really unpredictable life. So again, does anybody have any comments about this dichotomy between train, not dichotomy, but this coming together of training and an unpredictable life that is the what, what we wake up to every day? What, Susan, what do you mean by support? You said it, it takes you support to get you to get to the actually engage Bodhicitta. Well, the training, you know, take a look at, you know, Lojong slogans, for instance. Um, we were doing some, a little bit of Lojong yesterday in the, the Chen Rezig practice, um, the eight verses. And where it says things like, um, let others take the victory. You know, that's a kind of training and that's on the spot. You can be in a situation where you can have, you know, you can argue politics until the cows come home or you can let somebody else have the victory and go on, just move on. You don't always have to be right. You don't always have to have the last word. So that's a kind of training and that's applicable for me at least every day. Does that help? Is that what, that's kind of what I mean. Does that, does that mean what you mean? Does that well, make sense? I don't know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> does just, that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. You. So yeah. Um, there's one of the Lojong slogans, um, I'm not going to say it precisely, but it's something like, is if you can behave properly when you are really challenged, then you are well-trained. Training, training is, is that support. You, just, you can fall back on it. It's right there, right at your fingertips. Well, and I think that kind of, a few things that I've read just over the years, one of the ways that I think about, you know, these two types of, of um, bodhicitta is like one is the activities like of just us, right? Like living here in Sacramento, we've got like you were saying, you know, the training and then, then the kind of meant to be everyday practice. So we are, you know, these people aspiring and then, the ultimate bodhicitta is actually practiced by the beings who have arrived, you know, who who have attained, you know, the realization of emptiness, who have become fully realized Buddhas. So we are aspiring to that state. And, and it almost, to me, it's almost like a difference in the level of skill, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, and the refinement of your activities. So, you know, our activities are much grosser just because, you know, we're not there quite yet. Um, but, you know, the finer your activities are, the more it's an actual engaged bodhicitta rather than aspiring to have that level of skill. Okay. Thank you. And there's a thing in the chat. Alexa says, I think of training and practice as a feedback loop. Yeah, that's nice. One informs the other. I think that's, yeah, does that, that does make sense. That makes sense to me, right? Um, okay, so when preparing for this Shanti Deva study group that we have on Saturday mornings, I asked Lama about his thoughts about aspirational and active or engaged bodhicitta. And he said, that developing the aspiration itself is a paradigm shift. It's like, I have the aspiration to be a better person, kinder, less opinionated, less judgmental, more other oriented. 
And, you know, that's like a really incredible goal. It's very, very challenging. It's extremely essential and it's really hard to do. But really what he said is that really is just the ordinary self, the self on my driver's license, striving to become a better ordinary self. And that the paradigm shift, what's really needed, if I want to discover or experience bodhicitta, is to liberate myself from my ordinary self. And that leads me to another approach to finding bodhicitta. I just, I, I don't know, that phrase really stuck with me, to liberate myself from my ordinary self. So there's another level of change, a second order of change, if you will, um, what Lama calls a shift in our center of gravity. You've heard that before, a shift in our balance. He says that in Dharma, we're interested in a fundamental transformation of awareness, the shift out of our ordinary self, a fundamental transformation of awareness, a change in the balance point so that our sense of identity is not on our driver's license self, but instead our sense of identity is on our Buddha nature. There's this really famous saying that is attributed to Suzuki Roshi that I really am beginning to understand what he means when he says, you are perfect just the way you are and you could use a little improvement. And what he's talking about is your Buddha nature is perfect just the way it is and your ordinary self could use a little improvement. But I think that that being able to liberate oneself, being able to liberate myself from my ordinary self, that's the portal into aspirational and engaged bodhicitta. That's, that's the portal into the ultimate. Bodhicitta, that's the portal, even I think in the conventional bodhicitta. If, again, if conventional bodhicitta is not, I just want to be a better person, then there is a movement that is beyond that. So I can take my personal self, you know, I mean, I, I'm, me, I'm me, right? You know, warts and all. And I've got all these quirks and I've got all these characteristics and I've got all these, I've got years and years and years of stories. Like I'm old, right? So I got a lot of stories. And I combine that with the structure. I combine that with all the training. Elizabeth's still laughing at me. And I combine that with all the training, right? The reading and the discussion and all the sitting and the darshans the meetings with Lama and the talkings with Sangha members. And hopefully that gives me the support that I need, the knowledge about my, my ordinary self and the support of all of that training that I can just let go of my ordinary self and start to spontaneously engage in this very unpredictable, very active life. I think, I mean, it's, I've, I've read it, it's in, um, yeah, I didn't write it down now, of course I can't read, the, uh, the, the Ganges, Mahamudra, they talk about the leap. And I think that that's the leap, that's the letting go of the ordinary self and leaping into, through that portal, into bodhicitta. So what do you think? Any comments on all that? Um, yeah, I do, actually. I, you know, I, I've heard 
part of this poem uh, the other day as part of the, the Dalai Lama's celebration, you know, six day retreat thing. Uh, and part of this poem had this line, uh, it's a joy to be hidden and a, a, a travesty to be found or not to be found or something. Say that uh, again. It's a joy to be hidden, but a travesty not to be found. Oh, wow. I, and I've been finding a lot of uses for this particular line. And I think this is another application of it where, it, you know, there's sort of this, this joy in, in, in hiding from that unknown, but it's such a travesty not to find out what's there, you know, not to find out that other side of this. Um, yeah. And, you know, you sort of have to flip it in a way, but I think it's a, an application of the same line that, you know, you, you want to grasp and hold on to sort of what you have because you think it's good and you think it's really good because you, you get a lot of enjoyment out of it. But, you know, when you, you start to sort of think about it and, and go through the teachings, that there's so much more that you're missing. Right, be a traveler. You want to find that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and uh, Tashi Dele Lamala. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. Anybody got anything else? So that's a good segue, actually, into another little piece. There's another component of bodhicitta that I'm going to read from um, Trangu Rinpoche's um, commentary on uh, Shantideva. And this is in chapter three, where the uh, Bodhisattva vow is, is introduced. And so I'm just going to read the two verses that are the Bodhisattva vow, and then a little bit of his commentary. Um, so this is what he says. The next two verses are the actual vow to raise Bodhicitta. These words of Shantideva are borrowed and used in the current Bodhisattva vow ceremony. Just as the previous Shugatas gave birth to Bodhicitta, and just as they successively dwelt in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise, for the sake of all that lives, I give birth to Bodhicitta. And likewise, shall I too successively follow these practices. So in one form or another, we say that all the time. So this is, he goes on to say, the actual promise to engender bodhicitta is in itself not sufficient. Once we have resolved to engender bodhicitta, we must increase our bodhicitta. The best method for increasing bodhicitta is to take joy in bodhisattva activity. If we do something that we are satisfied with, then naturally the activity connected with it will expand and flourish. On the other hand, if we do something and afterwards think, well, that wasn't very good, then enthusiasm for doing that activity will decrease. For this reason, once we have resolved to engender bodhicitta, we should take joy in any associated activity related to engendering bodhicitta. That to me says that there's no distinction between aspirational and engaged bodhicitta. Bodhicitta will naturally arise when the two circumstances of aspiring to engender bodhicitta and by having joy in doing this activity are present. When these two come together, bodhicitta will naturally take place. So it really sounds to me what he's saying is there's there's no real distinction between the aspiration and the activity. I mean, I don't know how you could make a distinction actually. So I don't know, I thought that was really, I don't know, interesting. So bodhicitta then is not an action, it's not an activity, it's not even a participation, it's a state of mind. So awakening to our natural liberation, that's Lama's term, awakening to our natural liberation 
I think that aspirational and engaged bodhicitta are really just different degrees of energy of the same thing. And in a lot of recent talks by Lions Roar members, we've heard people expressing their awakenings. Um, when they've talked about, and I think I may have missed a paragraph in here, um, that Lama talked about um, liminal experiences, transformative experiences, foundational experiences, threshold experiences. So a lot of talks that we've heard from recent uh, Lions Roar members, we've heard people expressing a sort of awakening, um, talking about how their center of gravity has indeed shifted. And it's usually been in relationship to what Lama calls either a threshold experience or a, 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 a liminal experience. But I think it can also happen gradually. It isn't like that. Or maybe it's gradually and then there's a, something that happens that, that flashes you through that portal. Um, but we've been hearing these stories. Um, and what he says is that you, it involves choosing an approach, an orientation that is radically different. Radical meaning at the root, that is radically different from where we were. So just think back a few weeks. We heard one woman talk about how she ventured into a totally different part of the world where she had never been before, into an environment that was completely different from anything that she had experienced before. And how after, during and after that experience, it really did change the balance in her life. It's changed her life. It changed the course of her life. It was a liminal and express and a threshold experience, but I think it came after a buildup of support from trainings and from meditation, from darshans, all of that. And of course, you know, our lives. Another person talked about awakening to a radical understanding of interconnectivity that there's a fluidity between our own lived experience and the lived experience of others. And that led to her further awakening as to who she is. Another person shared some of her story um, where she related that when you're forced to completely change the way that you function in the world, that is really transformative. And the, the really important thing that, that I got from this woman's story was that once you've seen the change, once the transformation has happened, you can't go back. It's done, you've changed. So that's, you know, and I think that's, that's when you know you've gone through some sort of a portal, you've gone through something. So anyway, um, so I think just hearing these talks, I think that finding bodhicitta happens all the time. I think this movement, if indeed it is a movement from aspiration to action, from ordinary self to recognizing Buddha nature, I think this happens all the time on some level or another. And that, you know, gives me a whole lot of hope. It gives me a lot of inspiration. And I've been really, really grateful to hear all of these stories. I hope to hear a lot more. I hope to have some stories of my own at some point. So anyway, so that's all I had to say. And we're open for comments and suggestions and complaints. Hey, Susan. It was interesting because uh, a couple of days ago, I was just listening to a talk by um, Don Hendrick from the FPMT Center in Albuquerque and he was giving a talk on Bodhicitta but and he and he entitled it what is joy so he went straight to joy about the Bodhicitta but it was similar to everything that you're saying here all the things that he said um, and he but he went so far as to 
to like give examples of how we practice the bodhicitta, you know, and what's not naturally comes to us, but how we actually make everything become transformative. And he gave, for example, there was, there's this little booklet um, on the FPMT um, website that's downloadable um, from Lama Zopa, and it's called Bodhicitta, Bodhicitta Mindfulness Exercises. And it's just like, to me, it's, it's hard to do because some of them sound so silly. It's like, I'm, you know, taking a shower. And so I'm imagining all the, the, uh, the purified water going through all sentient beings and all the dirt and, and unpurified things going down the drain and that you can turn absolutely everything you do while you're awake into bodhicitta type activity, you know, bodhisattva activity, because you can take joy in that and that deepens your joy. And that's what he was trying to say is we need to really connect with that really deep level of joy, meaningful, lastful joy. And that's that bodhicitta that we can feel, you know, and everything being transformative. So it's really interesting that you gave this talk after I had just listened to that one because it, it folds in really well to kind of this overall, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> and it's so critical. Thank you. <laughs> and and Shanti Deva, you know, he he there are multiple, multiple verses about the greatness of bodhicitta and the joy of bodhicitta. So yeah, that's 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 all the way through the Bodhicharya Vatara. Thank you. No more. I just wonder if uh, if bodhicitta is just sort of an automatic, you know, I'm not a terribly sympathetic person, but I've been in a lot of instances where I knew people were seriously distressed and I forgot my fear of them or who they were and just stepped in and took their hand and said, tell me about it. And, you know, just though that's a small thing, but that does, I mean, that's sort of automatic. I don't see how you can um, miss that as, as uh, just an automatic bodhicitta. Um, for example, one time I was asked to visit a prisoner in the hospital, and I really wasn't up for visiting a prisoner in a hospital uh, because it just made me afraid. But then I, I sat down and I thought about it and I thought, okay, I'll do that. And um, this fellow was so distressed, I'll, I just felt like I needed to take his hand and um, sit with him. It was a very distressing situation as he had prison guards and a very loud tele television at the same time. And the guards had guns and I was afraid, but I could see he was more afraid than I was. So we were just sort of two people together uh, uh, thinking about the bigger things than just, you know, what's going to happen for lunch. And I, it was an automatic. It was very, a very automatic thing. After I overcome, came my fear, it was just like, oh, well, let me, let me take your hand. What's going on? And uh, so I just feel like these, these moments that come to you or they're there already you just sort of have to overcome your fear and and uh step in yeah thank you that's a really good example of going through that portal from the ordinary self to buddha nature thank you dell you unmuted for a few minutes um, yeah, actually, I really appreciate what you're saying, Susan. It's really um, helpful. 
And, and I appreciated what Elizabeth said too, that I think this, you know, when we rise to the occasion, when we're confronted with things that um, scare us, and instead of turning away from them, if we turn towards them and um, allow, say, the person that, that's maybe freaking out or something like that, um, and just allow them to do that and to be with them and not to run away in fear, then we do, um, I think we do grow as a result of that. Um, and, and that's part of becoming, that's part of the Bodhi, and learning how to be in Bodhicitta and to work with that um, more typically than we do in our daily life. Yeah. So um, I really, you know, I appreciated that. I'm, um, I'm, I just keep doing this thing with the bell. <laughs> Setting my phone you know, to do the bell and just to stop for a moment and just to be present because if I'm present in my body and I'm present in what's going on around me instead of getting it in my head, it's a lot, it's a much better place. I'm a much happier person and I think I take more joy in life, which is, you know. Which is, I think, what it's partially about. I mean, I have I have joy in studying, but that's just that's not really relating to people and being in situations where really you're called upon to expand and to be a you know a better person, as you were saying, than you are when you were sitting and studying. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hillary, you said you had a question. Um, yeah, I I don't know if this is really answerable, but do you have any <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have any advice for how to maintain compassion and a bodhicitta practice um, in the current political climate? Because I I find myself um, not being able to muster compassion for people that have different uh, views than I do. And I'm surprised that that this is happening to me, but I just, it's become, I mean, you know, it's been kind of like getting stronger over the last couple of years. And I just like, I find myself really getting solidified and just like, um, yeah. you know, I, I just don't, it, it seems impossible to get out of it, especially after the election. I just can't even imagine what, how to, how to deal with that. Yeah. Thanks for the question. We were just talking about that yesterday. Um, you know, one of the, the, um, suggestions that Shanti Deva has is that, the recognition, if you can, that really at the base, everybody has Buddha nature. We're all alike. We're all the same in that respect. And just like me, all of the, the people that are, are supportive of another view of politics, another view of life, I have my delusions. I have my obscurations, I've got my blind spots, and so do they. But that doesn't mean that I'm not a bad neighbor. That doesn't mean that they're a bad neighbor. That doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. That doesn't mean that they're a bad person. We just, we get covered up by delusions and obscurations. We forget who we were. We forget who we are. I, I don't know. That's that. That's where the training comes in. Yeah. Someone said, uh, one Sangha member said the other day, they said the best thing they could do with Donald Trump was to wish him to be able to immediately go and play golf in Shambhala. 
just sort of <laughs> to like get him out of here. But why, how about we wish him to go play golf in Shambhala? <laughs> Leave us all alone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's hear from other folks about how, how, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? We you all know, are dealing with this. What? You know, I went through an examination for being able to assist people and it was a psychological examination. And I expressed some very great, uh, aggressive emotions towards Donald Trump. And then I was asked if, um, if I would be able to assist him uh, if he had a deep problem and he wanted my assistance. And again, I thought, well, yes, he would be like anybody else who was in pain and who might be frightened yes. and yes. Uh, I found that I had that sympathy within me that he would have the same fear and pain that I might have too it's basic humanity I think and I think we all have that within us if we step beyond the ideal ideology and I'm a very political person, but if we step beyond the ideology at the base, we we all have that. We all have that, I think. Thank you. One thing that I heard is, uh, I think 90% in this poll, 90% of people in this country agree on one thing, which is that we're too polarized. So I thought that was kind of nice to hear that there's there's some kind of sense of uh, community and togetherness. The other thing I wanted to share is um, uh, I'll keep this as, as uh, cryptic as I can, but someone I'm working with um, was talking about a trip that they were going to go on with some some friends, and the friends were requiring uh, that everyone mask up when they were inside and maintain social distancing. And this person was really against that because they were afraid uh, or, or they said they didn't want their liberties to be um, impinged upon. So they weren't going to go on this trip because they, they couldn't handle the fact that their liberties were going to be impinged upon. And it, it kind of made me thinking about the differences for some people with the virus, um, of course, wanting to take every precaution possible and some people who think that it's it's a a front to their personal liberties. And what I told this person was that the, the common denominator to me seemed to be fear. Um, so looking for like the commonalities and all the political differences, I think um, right now very many people are afraid on, on all sides. And uh, so I think when we, when we can try to see from that, that compassion standpoint that there's a lot of suffering, um, we all bring our own narratives to that suffering. I think it helps me not to demonize quite so much. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. If I can jump in, um, I want to, I want to first, Susan, thank you for making this presentation today. I'm responding very strongly to it. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, also uh, to Elizabeth, and I guess to Andrew also, um, um, when Elizabeth said there was a, only a small thing to take the prisoner's hand, in my opinion, that was a huge thing. It may have felt like a small gesture for you to make, but I think f for the prisoner, it was a huge thing. Uh, that sense of connection, or um, if I'm using the term from Thich Nhat Han correctly, uh, the interbeing um, idea. Um, Anyway, I thank you again for, the, for, for, for this presentation, Susan. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Hillary, is that, any of that helpful? Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Good. Thanks for asking the question. Anything else? Also, if I can interject for one moment, I had another thought in terms of uh, political issues. And I have very strong personal political feelings, but um, we need to um, separate the politics from the person. We need to look at the person directly 
and not view them through the lens um, or the filter of their political opinions. Although I strongly believe my political opinions are are better in some ways. Um, they're, I, I, but I also know that I'm ignorant and wrong about a lot of things. And I really can't stand on any kind of superior uh, platform in relation to another person. So they have to be patient with me and I have to be patient with them, if that makes any sense. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Morris. I have another question uh, on the political front, because for some reason that's on my mind too. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're going to uh, kind of collectively be going through this liminal experience over this coming week or maybe beyond. Uh, it's going to be a, a very unstable, unsteady time, one of the most in my lifetime, I think. And so I'm just kind of wondering... Yeah, what are people bringing to this time? How are they bringing their bodhicitta? Uh, how are they preparing with their bodhicitta, um, with their practice? I, I hope that's not too vague of a question, but I think it's on all of our minds. And, and how do how do we use this? Uh, how do we bring it to the Dharma? That may actually be a, a really good um, question to bring to the Tuesday Night Sangha chat, Andrew. I, I don't know how Susan feels, but um, that might be a really good question to bring to that, which is sort of intended as like a an after sangha, after meeting chat. Um, I think it's a great question, and it is Tuesday night, so keep you away from the, the pulling madness a little bit. I, I don't know. You know, that's a really good suggestion. I mean, if we, if we, we need to get away and be with folks we know and trust and love, then there's 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 a place to go. So yeah, thank you. What time does that start, Connor? It's at six thirty. So it is the same time as Tuesday night meditation, um, which you know our schedule is actually pretty full. But um, you know, sort of pick what what's the best support for you on that night, and then Wednesday night there's Wednesday night meditation. Um, so try and keep things active um, throughout this time. That's sort of the goal right now. Um, is it on Google? Or? It's, it's on Google Meet. It's also, it's so it's in the Roar and it's on the, the regular calendar on LRDC. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That kind of brings me to something I was going to put in the announcement, but we might as well this is a good time to bring it up. Um, also in the roar, um, Connor pointed out that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is starting a three-day teaching on Bodhicitta on Wednesday, the day after the election. So um, as we all sort of probably know, we're not going to, we may not know the a lot of this stuff for a good number of days. So maybe, you know, tuning in to His Holiness's teachings um, for a few days could be of great benefit. Definitely get us away from the news. Hello, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Hi, Sue? Hi, this is, this is Sue on her little flip phone. <laughs> Anyway, first, I do want to thank Susan. It was a fabulous uh, talk again. But my, what I do, I, this political situation, I just felt maybe I could make a comment about that. I think one of the most important things for us to do is to be on the cushion, training our own calm center. I try very hard to maintain that for myself, knowing that if I can maintain my calm center, focused on that in my uh, meditations, in calming myself, I will be more able to inter, uh, interrelate with others in a positive, more calm way instead of getting uh, thrown off by my own opinions and my strong beliefs about the political situation. And again, with all everyone has said about recognizing the other person as a person and thinking of their pain, if, if they're reacting in a way I feel is a, a negative thing, they must be in a great middle of confusion also and sad pain. So I think that being on the cushion with the meditation 
and um, focusing on my own inner calm and my own good in nature. I think that's been helpful to me. And also not to feed in. I don't listen to all of the political stuff on the televisions. I don't let um, I don't let all that into my calmness. You know, I don't want to feed in any more of the uh, disturbances. So anyway, I hope it might be a little help. Maybe a little more meditation cushion time for us. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And I hope you see you on Wednesday at the meditation. Thank you, Sue. And then Alexis had a good question that we can address. Um, how do you bring bodhisattva action to friends and family who are closed off emotionally? Um, you know, I think that maybe Sue just sort of addressed that as one way is by example. You know, just um, holding your center, holding your balance, not being reactive. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this, it's not always, there was something I learned a long, long time ago, probably from a Pema Chodron book, um, that during the holidays and that, would hold true for any kind of emotional situation, such as the elections. And you're sitting at the, at the, at the, the Thanksgiving table and uncle George is ranting and raving about whatever it is that is pushing every button that you've got. And rather than exploding and getting into an argument with uncle George, you just go out for a walk. You just leave. That is not running away. That is skillful means. You know, so um, I'm not exactly sure, Alexis. Um, well, also, too, don't you think that if you can practice somehow saying, finding something to say in your mind that's positive, like it might be this person that you're really irritated with, but you say, may they can maintain their good health for the next year or something like that. You just, just like totally turn your head <laughs> away from whatever it's, it's taking on in you and try to think of something positive to say about that person, you know, that you might aspire for them or wish for them. Even if it's not a hundred percent filled in your heart, if you're not a hundred percent feeling that just say it in your head and it helps to turn that those emotions that we get so hooked into and it's hard to do sometimes to remember i don't mean to remember but just practicing that may they have a safe drive home may they you know whatever you can think of <laughs> that, that can come up right. that's positive about them another example where the training kicks in yeah i was reading something in uh, mind at ease uh a meditation that can be done on equanimity where you think about you know people that you feel intense love for and unconditionally and what if they did some actions that were uh reprehensible continuously hurtful and and uh you know it, would your would your love and and uh feelings for them start to lessen and then conversely those people that were that were having real challenges with what if they changed? What if they started to kind of recognize the error of their ways and uh, started behaving in these more uh, you know, compassionate and, and helpful ways? Would, would our feelings of them change? And so it, it kind of, I think it was speaking to that kind of impermanent nature um, that we kind of cling to this solid solidity of the people, either we, who we love or who we really dislike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, good. we want to be, to try to generate that equ equanimity um, to all beings. Yeah, it's not solid, right? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I think maybe um, we might all kind of keep in mind the Tuesday night. Um, what do you call it, Connor? Conversation or? Sangha chat. Sangha chat. So we might keep that in mind as, as a refuge 
Tuesday evening if we need it. Yeah, thank you. So um, I had one other announcement and it's just kind of a plug. There was an article in yesterday's um, B that the Sacramento Food Bank is feeding 250,000 meals a month. That is up 100,000 meals a month from last March. So over this pandemic period, they have virtually doubled the number of people that they are feeding. And so if you know you have an opportunity and, and are so moved, um, you could go to uh, Run to Feed the Hungry virtual 10K or just Run to Feed the Hungry and search for the teams, view teams and then search for Lions Roar Dharma Center. Lions Roar has a team in the Run to Feed the Hungry. And, you know, 250,000 meals a month. And so this is this, this Run to Feed the Hungry, although it's virtual this year, is the biggest run in the United States um, when they, they have it, actually. And it is obviously the biggest fundraiser that the Sacramento Food Bank has all year. So it's really, really essential for them, particularly this year. So just making a plug for that. Is there, yeah, go ahead. You got anything, Con? Anybody got anything else? Do prayers, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just put the, the link to the Run to Feed the Hungry in the chat. Um, you can also find uh, um, another fundraiser through um, GoFundMe um, on Facebook. There's, it's on Facebook also from Nagari Institute trying to fund, um, uh, get some great funding for um, the monks and the kids there, uh, Geshe Sewang, for uh, winter clothes and boots and hats and mittens. Um, sending stuff to India right now is a gigantic headache because um, the U.S. postal system is not playing nice with India, and India's postal system is all messed up. So I'm trying to do fundraising for that instead of actually sending things is uh, the way to go right now. Um, so I think I think the fundraising due to some really generous uh, donations is somewhere around um, $2,700 or something. So maybe a little bit more than that at this point. I don't know. Um, and I think that's probably going to close the next week or so and, and all that sent off to, to Nagari Institute so that they can buy clothes and hats and mittens for, for the kids and staff there. So that's another. Yeah, they're not just in India. They're in Ladakh. And Ladakh is, is around 14,000, 16,000 feet. I mean, oh, it's yeah. really cold there. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's, it's not the warm, balmy oh, India. Right. No. <laughs> this is Himalaya country. Right. This is freezing temperatures, and I don't, I don't think they have like they don't have heat like we do <laughs> at all. Hey, Connor, do you know if you received the Facebook funds that people donated? Yeah, so those um all went through GoFundMe. So oh, GoFundMe yeah, yes. yeah, that's and a that's really fast. easy system to get things out and to just deposit right into their account. Oh, that's good. That's a, that's a very easy system to deal with. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and they have a U.S. account system here, so that that's easier than trying to deposit it here into an account and send it to India. They have just a U.S. account that they can draw off of. So that's a really easy system. But any other announcements? Okay. No. Closing prayers. Closing prayers. Thank you all very much. Good discussion. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen, 
arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chandrasig, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losan Drachma, I make request at your holy feet. Okay. The verses that saved Sakya from sickness, a prayer for pacifying the fear of disease. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which, like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified. And may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health, and well-being. By the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, may these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thanks, everybody. Stay calm. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone.